Thanks for turning out this morning. We got a, a ton of uh, things to talk about. Actually, we're uh, very excited to show you what, what we've been up to. And I think uh, you're going to be pretty happy with uh, where we're heading and how close we actually are. We've been talking about things for a couple years. Um, this is the first career development symposium where we have working prototype uh, pilots to show you. And uh, we are literally uh, months away from unleashing some of these things uh, on you here. And we're, we really are on the road to uh, getting a lot of things uh, going better. Just out of uh, curiosity, or how many uh, folks are, are right from here stationed at uh, Norfolk Naval Station? OK, and uh, ships, ships versus uh, shore commands? OK, and then how about uh, Little Creek? Little Creek folks? OK, any Oceana folks here? That this just, OK, good. All right, good cross section. Well, it, it's great to have some, uh, such a big crowd here, and, and this is really important stuff. Um, we brought the team out here. We got the community managers, the detailers out here. Um, we raided uh, hundreds of packed sailors, both uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. I hope to do a couple hundred more today. Uh, we're going to be promoting some of those packed sailors that got their ratings under a new program where they get immediately pro uh, you know, promoted to uh, E4 once the rating is, is done uh, you know, today already. So uh, make use of the assets that we brought out here. Go talk to the detailers, talk to the community managers. Um, it's a lot less impersonal than working through uh, CMS ID and some of those uh, institutional programs that we have here. It's always good to have that face-to-face. -face. And the whole program that we have set up here today is a starting point for a conversation. Okay, we don't have to finish these topics. We don't even have to start any of them. So I just encourage you to ask questions along the way. Don't hold them till the end. Uh, we'll certainly leave time at the end. But if something comes up in the middle of something that's directly related, just step up to one of the microphones and let's make it a conversation throughout the day. I do ask you to step up to the microphones, though, so that everyone can hear the question. We'll try and repeat them uh, throughout so that, that everyone can hear them as well. Um, I think you've been through the Poll Everywhere tool that we have. That's, uh, that's kind of a useful tool for us as we're going along to help understand what the audience is thinking. And I think uh, Captain Bukacic went over that with you a little bit earlier this morning. But use that, and uh, we'll, we'll actually uh, have you interact with some of the presentations throughout the day. So before I get into the personnel stuff, the things we've been working with, Sailor 2025, and, and really the transformation efforts that we have going on, I uh, just want to kind of pull up to a little bit higher altitude for a second, talk about where we are, big Navy. And we're going to drill into a lot of these topics throughout the morning. But uh, you know, uh, the world ha is a less friendly place these days. And uh, the geopolitical situation, uh, the um, you know, global uh, competition landscape has changed significantly. and. We're referring to the situation we're in now as, a, as another era of uh, great powers competition. Um, no, no more superpowers, just the US and the former Soviet Union. It's, it's kind of like the time before World War II when Great Britain, France, um, uh, Germany, Japan, all these powers were building up. And any two or three could align and, and really be something to be reckoned with. We're kind of entering back into that era again with uh, near peer threats like China, uh, Russia now, the Russian Federation, and, uh, and then all these other actors that are, that are uh, continuing to you know, do less than good things uh, throughout the world. And when we're, historically, when we've been in these great powers um, competition periods, the Navy has been the, the force of the United States Armed Forces that's really kind of uh, been the, the service to provide our leaders the options uh, to deter bad activity, to respond, uh, to be there to support allies. And Congress really, I think, recognized this this year with the, the FY18 National Defense Authorization Act, where they said, hey, we need a bigger Navy. Uh, and they made it a law that we're going to have at least 355 ships. So. This year's budget, which is uh, on a five-year plan, so fiscal years 18 through 23, 
has now funded us to go from today's 282 ships up from last year's 275, which was the lowest, smallest Navy that we've had in 100 years, uh, to 326 ships by uh, the end of 2023. So that's pretty substantial ship count growth, and, and those are warships too. Those are substantial combat ships, including uh, you know construction of uh, a couple more carriers uh, in that in that uh, time frame. So with that comes about 21,000 more sailors over five years. So we are again in a growing navy. How many of you have been in the navy while it's been growing? Anyone? Nah, none of you have. You, you really haven't. We, this Navy hasn't been growing since about 1992. It's the last time it had any real growth. We've either been steady or going down. And all of our personnel policies were aligned to make ourselves smaller. Relatively easy to get out of a service contract. Uh, and we had force shaping measures in place all the time. So things like Seaway, that four letter word that I hate, perform to serve, all those things that came before it, the ERB, another heinous word. Those were all necessary because we had to downsize and we had to go make cuts in an effort to keep the best but send some home uh, to, to uh, meet uh, congressionally mandated size restrictions. That's gone. I mean, for at least the next 10 years, we are going to be ramping up and accelerating in size uh, at a pace that we haven't seen since the 600 ship, you know, Navy goal of the, the Reagan era. And it's about the same size increase in, uh, in numbers of people. So that FY23, 21,000 people, I expect as the budget years continue out and we work with Congress to comply with that 355 ship mandate, somewhere around 2030 to 2035, we'll reach that uh, 355 ships. That's going to be yet another almost 20,000 people. So we'll go from today's about 325,000 um, people in the active component of the Navy, uh, I'm talking here, uh, to about closer to 350,000. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 375,000 uh, by the time we're done with it. So uh, substantial growth, what is that going to mean for all of you? Advancement opportunity, bonuses, you've seen what the SRB messages have been doing. Uh, you know, normally those are out twice a year. We've, we've done five already this year and it's June. We're turning the analytics as fast as we can and where we see a need, we're tweaking up and we're stacking the deck. Frankly, we want a thick bench. Because if you think about it, all you folks out here, especially you second and um, first, second, and third class petty officers out here in the audience, you are going to be the command master chiefs, the commanding officers, the commodores of that 355 ship Navy when it's here. You know, we'll, we'll be long gone, guys like me. You'll, you'll be the folks running it. So we've got to stack the deck with the talent that's out here in this room. You're going to be the leaders of that Navy. So pretty exciting time. Advancement opportunity will be there, and the opportunity for any of those leadership types of things, whatever it is that you want, whether it's uh, you know command master chief kind of path or an officer program, LDO, whatever it is that you want to seek out, the opportunities are going to be uh, large compared to what you had. So forget about the old rules. Ask, and uh, and and don't be necessarily put off by the instructions. We're updating MILPERS manual articles, you know, 15, 20 of them a week as fast as we can, and we're not keeping up with it. So just because the MILPERS manual says, you know, you can't do something, if it doesn't make sense in the context of we're growing, we want to keep people in, and we want to keep them in for the long haul, and you're a talented performing sailor, ask the question. You know, we have a lot of leeway for exceptions when it makes and it makes sense for the company. The other aspect here that I'm really particularly excited about, though, is uh, really what, what makes this job uh, you know, such a great one for me personally is 
when I think about what we're doing operating uh, day in and day out, and, and, and those of you that have been operating on ships uh, you know, recently and are, are routinely out on the pointy end of the spear, you know what it's like, you know, whether it's out in the South China Sea off of uh, North Korea, uh, the Arabian Gulf with the IRGCN getting more and more aggressive, or in the Red Sea with uh, Houthi uh, uh, terrorists, frankly, uh, taking uh, uh, you know, fairly high-tech coastal defense cruise missiles that they've been supplied with and sh taking pot shots at our uh, DDGs. Then you go into the Mediterranean, uh, kind of back to the future there, right? We're operating in close proximity with the Russians uh, while we're simultaneously doing strikes into Syria and Libya. And then up in the Black Sea, they've reestablished, uh, you know, submarine foothold up there with uh, land cruise missile, land attack cruise missile capabilities up there, a new submarine base uh, for the Russians in, uh, in Syria now. And it, it's kind of back to the height of the Cold War in, ter in terms of operating close proximity with those folks routinely while we're doing really, really complex operations. And regardless of where we are, they're coming out and testing us uh, for a couple different reasons. One, they're pissed off because we're in their backyard, which I think should give you all some job satisfaction because they really can't routinely operate in our backyard yet. Although they're getting better, you look at a, you look at a worldwide chart any given day and you look at all the, if I showed you a chart and, and it showed you 12 red dots around the world and asked you whose Navy that was, you'd probably say that's the United States Navy deployed around the world. It might be the People's Liberation Army Navy because unlike three, four years ago, they're building and, and actually exercising a fairly worldwide deployment capability now. They're not up to our pace yet, but it won't be long because they don't have to build it from scratch, right? They, they steal all our ideas, all our systems, and they just go out and implement it fast, as fast as they can. But for now, we can still operate routinely day in and day out 24, 7, 365 in their backyards, and it infuriates them. So we're going to stay there because we're America's away team. But the other piece of this is they, they like to come out and test us uh, and see if they're up to snuff and ready to go against the United States Navy. And I think that uh, with the confidence that you continue to display every time you go out and operate, uh, that that sends them home thinking, you know, maybe another day. And that's what we'll need to continue to do, just go out there and, and uh, let them know that we're not going to flinch. I will tell you, though, that the, uh, the thing that they're most envious of, and when I've served in overseas assignments, uh, every chief of Navy and, you know, any, any uh, leader in those other navies, that the thing that they talk to me most frequently about is, you, the, the uh, independence, your ingenuity, your innovation, the way that you could solve problems, and the amount of responsibility that, that you personally take on, even if it's not formally handed to you, the, the United States Navy sailor. And that's the part that makes me proud about this job, is that I can be in a position to help you. So we've really taken this mission on board. Sailor 2025 is about that, about putting things back where they belong in your hands, delegating down to the uh, lowest level possible, and uh, making customer service um, what it should be in the personnel world. Uh, not a phrase that you normally associate with the Navy's personnel system. You know, I've been a customer of it for 36 years, but the company has taken on that mission uh, across the board, whether it's Navy Personnel Command, Naval Education Training Command, or Recruiting Command, the whole mpt and &E enterprise has committed to becoming a cu customer service organization. We're not there yet, but we're, we're working hard every day. And you're going to see a lot of the stuff that we're rolling out is aimed at that, giving you what you deserve, making your pay right uh, the first time every time, uh, getting those travel claims liquidated immediately. And a, and a lot of stuff that I'm going to show you today will show you how we're fixing it. Uh, we're still working with kind of, uh, you know, 
uh, bear skins and stone knives in some respects with antiquated uh, 1960s databases, 255 systems, no two of which talk to each other, which hamper our ability to do that. But a year from now, that's all going to be gone. It's all going to be unplugged, and you're not going to recognize it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So with that kind of uh, intro and our ability to help you, our most precious asset, let me uh, just kind of give you a, one more piece of context before I talk about Sailor 2025. You know, everywhere I go, we talk about uh, Manning as a first issue. And uh, what I hear universally is that Manning is, is it good, is it bad, does it suck? Are we in the Hurt Locker? What do you guys think? Slow. Slow. Yeah, everybody says that. Everyone says Manning is, is bad. We're in the Hurt Locker. Um, I will tell you that uh, Manning is not where we want it to be. I agree with that. And we're about 7,500 gaps at sea right now, which is uh, unacceptable. Uh, it's going to get a little bit worse uh, until the start of the next fiscal year in October by a, a few hundred, and then it's going to start to improve uh, exponentially. And then we're never going to go back to that again. Uh, if we could go to the third slide, please, the kind of the uh, Manning trend line. So historically, you know, we've always kind of played games big Navy budget-wise with how we pay for frankly, everything, but manpower is just one more example of that. The um, manpower count, if, if just to really give you a simplified version of this, is, is kind of really broken into two pieces. You know, all of the people that we have, which today is about 325,000 people, and we pay for that each and every time. We're religious about that. And then, with a Navy of about 325,000 people, on any given day, we're training new people. People are in their A schools or block zero, using the ready relevant learning terms, or they're in transit between duty stations, or they're in some sort of fleet training, you know, advanced training levels. Uh, and that's about 10% of the Navy. 10 years ago, that used to be 25% of the Navy. We've worked really hard to reduce that overhead. But even 10% of the Navy on any given day is over 30,000 people that are not in a billet, not doing a job on a ship or an operational billet, an aviation squadron, expeditionary unit, what have you. What we like to do is when budget times get tough, we like to wish away that overhead account, that fact that we've got those 30,000 people that aren't in billets. And We've always sort of done that in the Navy, but it didn't really become a big issue until sequestration kicked in and we were really squeezed on the budget and everything got super, super tight. And when you start taking this many, 325,000 billets, 30,000 in training that you should also be paying for, but you say, you know what, I'm only gonna pay for 15,000 of those, which is what we did, we paid for half. And year after year after year over sequestration, you've only paid for half of those, those 30,000 people that are not in billets, but you really need, because you need to get them ready to go into billets. That starts to stack up over a three or four year period. And that's how you end up with 7,500 gaps at sea after three or four years. For the first time in my 36 years in the Navy, we fixed the Navy's budget process to where this can't happen again. So our fiscal year 18 uh, manpower budget is fully funded. It's never been that ever before. Um, it's stuff like this that was causing the permanent change of station, you know, the PCS orders, uh, delays, kind of all the last minute stuff that would happen every summer the last three or four years. Have you noticed that hasn't happened this year? Everyone's got about a five and a half, six month lead time right now, unless there were some ORD mods or per particular circumstances, but 99% of the orders that we're writing are five and a half months or longer lead times, even right now at the peak move season. And that's gonna stay that way going forward. The fact that we've finally fixed this structurally has allowed us to 
crank open the uh, numbers of accessions, the new sailors that we're bringing in through boot camp. Uh, we did that as soon as we could. We actually started that in FY17, and we're starting to catch up. Those new sailors are showing up in, in large numbers as apprentices in our fleet. And then the things that we've been doing with the SRB and all that flurry of nav admin stuff that you saw last summer, the uh, EAOS to prescribe C tour, the higher tenure changes, the CPOs to C, all that really uh, improved our sea duty manning drastically. And if you look at this chart here, it, had we just cranked up the new sailors coming in and done nothing else, we would have been on that red line. We would be able to man all of our sea duty, and I'm calling sea duty, you know, that's all operational billets. That's, you know, ships, aviation squadrons, submarines, uh, expeditionary units, everything that's operational. If we peanut butter spread across the entire set of operational billets, it, we'd be manned 86%. We don't do it that way, right? We man deployers higher to 95 and non-deployers a little bit lower until they're ready to work up to deploy. And uh, so, you know, if you add 5% to that, that number, that's where a deployer would be. The blue number at the top is where we are because of all those policy changes we made. And those policy changes also happen to set us up for being a growing Navy. So it was kind of a twofer, really improved manning because of, you know, the volunteerism that, that uh, you all put forth with some of those things that were, put, that were uh, offered last year. We gained uh, almost 3,000 man years uh, of, of sea duty back, and that's what's bumped that curve, that manning curve up so much and improved it. But you see it's still going to bottom out at the beginning of FY19. 91.1% if we spread it out, add 5%. We'll have deployers well over 95%. There's going to be individual NECs and ratings that are short, but then it's going to go up pretty fast. By 2020, 2021, everyone's going to be back in the green, and we're not going to go back because we've got this budget issue fixed. We're going to go up, and we're going to stay up going forward. Our goal going forward is to, after we've stopped this nonsense of this up and down with budget shenanigans, uh, we're going to go to a, a world in which we keep manning between 98 and 100 percent and then set goals for ourselves based on any C fit. And right now the, the metric for fit is rate and rating. Uh, but the thing that we're wrestling with is specific NECs that would prevent, you know, a unit from deploying. Uh, once we go to NEC fit, then we're going to be in a much better situation and we'll get out of this business of having to do a cross decks and diverts uh, at the last minute as, as, as folks are preparing to deploy. So that's a little bit about why we got in that situation and where we're heading. Uh, the, the news is you know, it's going to get just a little bit worse here over the next few months, and then it's going to improve drastically. But we fixed the, you know, foundational problem that, that's been causing this, and we're paying for what we need going forward. And we have tremendous support from the leadership, you know, CNO, Secretary of the Navy, and Congress fully funded this going forward. So we're not going to go back to doing this. The other thing I would tell you, though, is that those percentages of manning, you know, that's driven by a denominator that's defined by the requirements on the ship. What have we been doing with the requirements on our ship? Just been raising them, right? We rarely are saying we need fewer people on our ships. They've been going up. And uh, this next slide, if you go to the uh, history reference, that, that's the whole grunge of manning actions. We talked about that. Let's go to the back, it's back to the first slide, I'm sorry kind of a look at where we were in 2012, five, six years ago, versus 2017. You know, a DDG in 2012 was deploying with, on average, 240 sailors. They were getting that 240th sailor the day they deployed. Last year, on average, the DDGs were leaving with 272 sailors, and they were getting that 272nd sailor somewhere between eight and 12 months before deployment. So the bulk of the deployment workup period, they had the whole team on board training. Now there's exceptions, these are fleet averages, but 
we've really raised the standard on ourselves as a Navy, and that's a good thing. We've got to raise that even higher, and we are. Continuing on with the DDG example, we've done in-port work studies. We know that we ask more of crews in port. We've never based crew manning on in-port workload. It's always been on at-sea uh, watch station manning. Well, last year we went out and did work studies, and guess what we found out? Some divisions are undermanned in port. No shit. Any sailor could have told us that. But now we have a formal study that I can take to Congress and say, you know, give me $27 million to put this many more sailors on DDGs, this many more on amphibs. But we went out and did the homework that we had to do to convince Congress to fund the billets. So that DDG number is because of import work studies, revising the definition of all of the things that we ask of you at sea uh, and, and redefining the work day uh, uh, at sea. A DDG is going to have about 325 sailors on it by uh, the end of 2019, uh, 2020 timeframe. And that's true of every class of ship. So factor that in and think about that graph I showed you. Those percentages include manning to those higher manning levels. So that's percentages of higher manning levels that are going up. That's a really good news story. You're going to feel f perhaps flooded with new people, which is going to create other challenges, and uh, we'll need to be prepared for those. So that's the context. I think we fixed it. We got a little bit more pain to weather until all the corrective actions uh, take hold, but, but relief is on the way. So that's where we are with manning, and if you've got questions on that, please. Uh, jump in, or we can take them at the end. If not, I'm going to move on to Sailor 2025. Let's go ahead on the, thank you. So this has been uh, kind of uh, in the works now for a little over two years. We, we started this uh, when uh, Abel Moran was Chief of Naval Personnel. I was working for him as, uh, as uh, one of his deputies. And uh, we really kind of crafted this thing because we saw the you know, the looming uh, war on talent. It was, it, was, it was about recruiting, it was about retention. Um, we knew that we, whether we were going to be downsizing or growing, we needed to retain the best talent possible. And in order to do that, we needed to change the way we did business. So we set out to really kind of look at what the commercial world was doing, went out on a lot of listening tours, and we still have the lines open. Most of these ideas, frankly, came from talking to sailors. And we still get our best ideas from fleet engagements. But the first column is everything we knew we had to do to unscrew our archaic personnel system. And those are really just the policies, not the systems by which we deliver them. And I think you know about most of these. The second column, ready, relevant, learning. I'll come back to each of these. And then the third one, a whole lot of different things that, uh, you know, talking about personal development, professional development, achieving some life work balance, all in the uh, uh, column of uh, career readiness. Hitting on the personnel system uh, modernization, uh, meritorious advancement. We're uh, in our uh, now really third full year of implementation. And, and like everything that we're doing with Sailor 2025, we're trying to get things out there quickly not do this normal BS Washington DC business as usual where we polish the cannonball for 10 years, get it exactly right, and by the time we roll it out, it's you know overcome by events, it's useless. As soon as we had it ready, we threw it out there, took some risk, some intelligent risk, and we did it. The first year we did MAP, we just turned over 5% of the Navy-wide advancement um, uh, opportunity over to the the, the command triads. No controls whatsoever. We knew we were going to run the risk of over advancing in a few rates, and we did. We did it in four rates, and we just went ahead and mortgaged ahead on future advancement opportunities so that we didn't have to zero out any rates uh, for the future. The next cycle we did, we put some controls in place. We opened it up to shore activities. We expanded it a little bit, and we've been continually tweaking it since then. Uh, removed the time and grade requirements for E4 and E5 last year, and now this year, we're up to about 20% or so of the Navy-wide advancement opportunity, and 
although we didn't explicitly remove the time and grade requirements for uh, meritorious advance with E6, there's a waiver provision in there because we feel really strongly that if the command triad has a mature leader that's ready to be a first class petty officer, they've got the supervisory skills and the leadership skills, then time and grade shouldn't matter. This is exactly the thing that we're trying to unscrew with our eval system. This is why we started MAP. It's about merit. Some people develop those skills sooner than others. The clock shouldn't matter. The calendar shouldn't matter. So there's a waiver proviso for E6s as well. And that may soon go away as well and just be, it's commanding officer's judgment. We just really kind of want to collect data on this first year. So that, that's running good and we generally get good feedback. We continue to expand that out to smaller and smaller uh, UICs, but everyone's got an opportunity, every command's got an opportunity for some number of uh, meritorious advancements. Detailing marketplace is probably the thing I'm most excited about because it kills two of my most hated uh, pieces of equipment. Admiral Weitzel's laughing because he knows exactly what they are. CMS ID and Seaway will go away because we've put about as much lipstick on those pigs as we can. <laughs> they suck. I hate them, right? <laughs> I, the, uh, I, uh, I'm glad to hear you uh, say that. Uh, but Seaway to me uh, and CMS ID, CMS ID was an attempt at, at doing some talent matching, but that embodies the lack of transparency that we are trying to get away with, or get away from. <laughs> Clarification. <laughs> Detailers never lie, the truth just changes. <laughs> so, detailing marketplace is gonna show you everything. It's gonna be completely open kimono even things that you may never, ever be able to have. But you're adults, you can handle the truth, right? We wanna treat you like adults. You're gonna have the whole picture. Uh, the advantages of having the whole picture, though, are you're gonna be able to reach out directly to commands. Uh, you're gonna be able to work some uh, horse trading deals with uh, your shipmates. That's always been possible, but you couldn't see it, so you had to hear about it or know somebody that was negotiating for something. So if there's an apples to apples trade opportunity, we'll, we'll do that if it really is an apples to apples trade. So there's a lot of goodness there. And then we're gonna kind of look at opportunities to uh, negotiate for more than just the next job. Let's start thinking longer term. What if we start negotiating for two jobs downstream? You know, what, the, what does that conversation sound like? And let's make it a conversation. Let's make it uh, not just, you know, uh, jack in the box, turn the crank and the answer spits out and take it or leave it. And you, you play chicken with us until you separate, uh, which is what goes on with CMS ID right now because it's, it's not human. It's not perhaps humane. So we want this conversation to go on. If, if you want to stay in Norfolk for one more tour to get your son or daughter through high school, and that's part of the negotiation. What would you be willing to do for that tour after your son or daughter graduates from high school? Would you be willing to go to Bahrain or FDNF Japan? Or, you know, whatever the Navy might ask of you then. If so, we could probably work a deal for a, a you know, follow on guaranteed uh, location. Or you're mobile now and uh, expeditionary and you're ready to go anywhere, send me that hard job, send me the hardest job and the hardest location you got. But when I get back, I want an educational program. I wanna go do something in residence. What can you do for me if I go do this for you, Navy? We'll have that conversation too. Or, which if you read last week's NAV admin on advance to vacancy, how many saw that NAV admin? That's a pilot program uh, we're just doing it for senior chiefs and master chiefs this first round. Uh, but we're going to take hard jobs in hard locations where we need quality people. Back to this idea that time and grade doesn't define talent. We're going to run a special board 
look for people that are really ready to be senior chiefs and master chiefs, pick them for these particular jobs. And if, if they're picked, they're going to have an opportunity to go to that job and be promoted that day, get the pay. We're going to call it spot promotion. They'll be promoted as long as they're in that billet. And then they're going to have board precepts that say, if you're in that job and you're doing pretty well in that job, you ought to be promoted by normal means as fast as possible. So they'll get permanently promoted as well. And if everything goes well, you know, they just, they're that rank from that thing forward. We've done this uh, on a limited uh, case for officers for a while. If, if this goes well with the senior chief and master chief thing, then that's part of the detailing marketplace. There's going to be jobs up there. You know, you're an E5 negotiating for um, orders. You may see a handful of first class petty officer jobs that are advanced to vacancy jobs and they'll be available to you and you know going to that is, is instant rank and the pay that goes with it when you go to that job. I think people would sign up for a hard job in a hard location if it meant instant advancement. I think people would, would bite into that. Or there's the other, C, or the other uh, kind of CMSID case of, you know, there's this great job in uh, San Diego and there's another one in, uh, you know, uh, Atsugi. And two people have uh, bid on the Atsugi job, 3,700 have bid on the San Diego job. So we'll put a little, we'll put a little kicker in, uh, you know, what if we add a $250 per month, you know, kicker if you take the Atsugi job? That's not enough, it only got us three people. Okay, well, let's see what 500 a month does. So it's gonna be a marketplace. So pays, location, education, but to get into that kind of discussion, we have to be talking about multiple tours. Uh, for single tours, you know, merit uh, will, will come into play. Merit as measured by our new advancement or uh, evaluation system, because our current one really uh, isn't doing a very good job of that. We'll talk about that as well. The team has brought a working demo of detailing marketplace here, and they're gonna go over it, spend about an hour on it. I think you're gonna like it. You're gonna like it a lot. Uh, the evaluation system, I want to I talk to you a lot about that one, too. We got a Q&A panel a little bit later. Uh, don't let us get off the stage on that Q&A panel without talking about evaluations. Rating modernization, we're going to drill into heavily as well. Why we're doing it, what the, the twists and turns are. So I'll kind of move on from this. Ready Relevant Learning is, is moving along well. Uh, we've actually accelerated a lot of it because of the the things that we learned following the McCain and Fitzgerald collisions, we're going to take some of this virtual reality technology where we can, you know, take classrooms full of flat panel displays and turn it into a bridge or a combat information center or a submarine attack center or tomahawk launch, you know, VLS space, uh, air traffic control center on a, on a, on a, a carrier, whatever we want, uh, hour to hour, but we're going to add these to bridge trainers uh, so that they can add the CIC watch standards and, and practice that integration. That was something that the surface force has been missing because of lack of trainer facilities. And we're going to do the same thing on the CIC trainers that we have, add a bridge, uh, virtual bridge trainer mock up around it to kind of get uh, four times the training capacity out of the, the trainers that we have right now. Uh, so things like that are accelerating. and. Uh, by the end of this year, all 51 rates that are going to go into block learning will be in block learning. We're on track to do that. So again, the block learning is the first step in Ready Relevant Learning. That's breaking the training up from our current version of A schools and C schools, and we're going to break it up into blocks. So block zero is kind of A school light. It's just what you need to get through that first tour. There's a little block one. Uh, you know, booster shot somewhere in the first C tour or operational tour, no more than five weeks, depending on your rating, it may be, it may be zero, maybe one week, but it could be up to five weeks. And then if you go back to a second C tour, you'll go back for another block of, it could be fairly long training, six months, nine months, but it'll be ashore before you go to that C uh, uh, billet. So. You'll go to schools before you go to each C tour again and really get buffed up on the latest equipment, the latest modernization, 
all that stuff. So that's the first phase of re ready relevant learning, just getting at the right times in the career paths. And we're almost done with that. The uh, second phase, though, is how we give that training to you. And uh, we're about uh, a, a third to a half of the way done rewriting the curriculum and finding out what the right balance is between classroom, actual hands-on equipment, and how much of this can we really do and do right through virtual reality. The virtual reality stuff uh, is out there and a lot of our training centers have it right now, but there's even better stuff that's out there. Ha has anyone here seen the LCS trainers? Anyone graduate from the LCS trainers? Those, those things are like phenomenally high fidelity trainers and our sailors that go through there come out qualified, their first watch station, they're qualified PQS to do maintenance. They report to their ship and they're on the watch bill. They're doing maintenance. They're not, they're not a burden to the ship. They're not non-quals for nine months. They are qualified the day they show up. That's good for you on the ship. That's good for them. Imagine how you would have felt a new sailor show, showing up to your first ship or squadron, immediately being part of the team, being a productive part of the team. That's, that's how realistic these uh, newer high fidelity uh, virtual reality simulators are. That's what we're talking about with the, the, the ready relevant learning technology. And we're going to put that out at the waterfront so you don't have to fly to, you know, uh, Great Lakes or Pensacola or Groton to get the training. You'll be able to do it right there at the waterfront because it's cheap and we can have lots of it. And eventually we're going to put it on the ships too. And we've, we're working on data transmission paths and everything for storing the training records so that eventually, you know, you'll be able to have the equivalent of a fleet temps and even your training and proficiency uh, at the, the, the ship's leadership's fingertips so they can write watch bills and match talent and look at experience and proficiency and, uh, and all that stuff. So that, that's tracking along pretty well. Um, and then the career readiness front is really a mix of things. Um, the first piece there is on leader development. You saw Mick Pond's uh, document that came out a few weeks ago, laying the keel. Uh, enlisted leader development uh, uh, rework. Uh, Fleet Smith uh, is here with me. He's one of the architects of that and he's available to talk in detail about the sort of the philosophical changes that are behind that. Uh, I encourage you to ask him some questions. Uh, same with the officer leader development plan. Both of them though, you know, lots of emphasis on character. We've always talked a lot about technical competence, tactical competence. Our focus today is on the character piece. We, we do a good job of that at boot camp. We do a good job at, at commissioning for officers, but we sort of had been taking it for granted that that was enough. And what we now know is that character is like any muscle for any athlete that's training for uh, competition. If you exercise it, it, it gets stronger. And character is really important in our service uh, because we do so much stuff over the horizon out of communications with our leadership. Our civilian leaders, our uniform leaders have to have trust in us. So we as leaders have to have character. And as importantly, our sailors have to trust us as leaders. So our character matters uh, a great deal from that perspective as well. We really have to think about our character because everybody in this room is a leader, uh, whether you want to acknowledge that or not. The fitness piece, um, we keep tweaking on the PFA. A lot of, a lot of people blogged about the, uh, you know, uh, the consequences of uh, failure on the PFA when we changed that uh, uh, last fall. Uh, let me put that in perspective for you a little bit, though. Um, 2015, we changed the standards from, uh, we changed the rules a little bit on the body composition standards. Uh, to make them uh, a little bit more reasonable for age and things like that. We're still more stringent than the DOD standards, but we adjusted them a little bit. We also went from the three failures in four cycles to two failures in three cycles. Uh, three cycles later, so end of last uh, year, last fall, we got to that point uh, under the new rule set where people had come through and now we were getting the two out of three cycles under the new rule set. And we had 1,700 sailors, first term sailors, on sea duty uh, that we were going to have to separate because of PFA that were within 
10 seconds on the run, tenth of a percent on the body fat, you know, a little bit here and there. And um, given that we had 7,500 gaps at sea, it didn't make sense to me to send another 1,700 sailors on sea duty home right then. So I changed the rules so that there wouldn't be more gaps at sea. That's the truth. And it, it just doesn't seem right to me that while we're trying to grow, that we're going to let those folks off the hook. So the fitness enhancement program also really went into effect in 2015. I don't think it's being executed across the fleet the way it was intended to. It's certainly not being executed with the teeth it was intended to, and it needs to be. So we're going to continue to press on that. The, the other thing that we changed here is if somebody does fail, unlike before, you've got an opportunity to immediately get out of that um, status and restore your ability to transfer, restore your ability to, to advance quickly by simply getting back within standards and, and taking the formal test. So that's different. But it really was, you know, 1,700 more while we already had 7,500 losses. Let's, let's go work these folks and get them to within standards. The bigger change, though, we also changed last year the, if you get an outstanding or excellent, you get the clep out of the next one. How'd you guys like that one? That one, that one made a giant difference. How many people fail, you know, what fraction of people in the Navy are failing the PFA? Less than one-tenth of a percent, okay? It's not a lot. When we changed that excellent to outstanding rule, 10% of the Navy moved from, moved into the excellent an outstanding category, 10% of the Navy, almost 40,000 people. So that's what I want to focus on. How do I move everyone that's already within standards and wants to do far better? That's what winning teams do, right? They focus on higher performance for the entire team. I don't want to focus on performance at the failure line. I want to per focus on performance up here. How else can we incentivize that? Outstanding, excellent. Well, I welcome your ideas. We'll do it if it makes sense. But that's the way the whole team needs to be thinking. The, uh, the other piece here on the family framework, you know, the, there is a, a family framework the CNO signed out. That's about command outreach to families, a lot more big Navy support to family programs that we sort of uh, let atrophy while money was tight during sequestration. We've got to restore those. But even more than that, on the Sailor 2025 front, this is about rethinking our view towards uh, having a family, starting a family and raising a family while you have a, a, a career in the Navy, a demanding seagoing career in the Navy. Uh, that has to be okay, and we have to make that possible for everyone to do. Uh, it's a reality. Uh, whether you're uh, a man or a woman, that you're going to have to, you know, have to have times where life-work balance becomes important. And right now, that's not part of our culture. If you take time off, you know, your shipmates or someone is going to be frustrated with you because you're not carrying your share of the load. If you're habitually taking time off, that's another thing. But if it's, you know, here and there because you've got legitimate needs, you know, we have to start thinking them a little bit beyond next Monday's underway uh, and, and thinking about the long haul. And a lot of Sailor 2025 is about that because at the end of the day, we're looking for longer careers, the ability to move around, have the flexibility that you need throughout that longer career so that we can retain you longer and get more return, more experience, uh, more quality uh, in everybody that, that's in the Navy and bring fewer in the front door. And the ones that we bring in are all high quality. That's what we're looking to do here. Smaller, better, tighter team, even though the Navy's growing. And I think we can do that. But we have to change our culture with this life-work balance thing. It's gotta be okay to get off the treadmill now and then, knowing that you're gonna get right back on it as soon as you can. And today, we just don't allow that to happen. Things like the career intermission program, sailors can take two to three years off to go start and raise a family. You come back in, you start with a new peer group, so you don't take any hit on promotion or advancement. 
We had 160 sailors do that. Every one of them that's come back in has advanced just fine. We had five sailors go use this for things like uh, college degrees. They, they went on SIP intermission. They used their post 9-11 GI benefits, got a degree. One came in as a JAG, one as a medical staff corps officer, things like that that they couldn't that they were unable to do through other Navy programs because of particular circumstances, they figured out their own path and, and made it happen. We'll support it if it's a legitimate reason uh, for career intermission program. Uh, and then child development centers, we expanded the hours across the Navy last year. We're continuing to work to, as fast as we can find qualified child care providers, uh, expand the capacity at those uh, centers as well. So that work continues. We gotta do more there and we'll continue to work that Next slide. The, I think the biggest thing here, though, is how we're going to deliver all that, and this is kind of getting to the IT piece of it. The thing that's really causing our, uh, our hiccups right now, the, the pay issues, the travel claim uh, delays, is, is really these fragile systems that we have. Our, uh, you know, they're, like I say, a lot of these things are 1960s, vintage, museum-ready uh, IT systems. Uh, some of them have punched cards in them and run on a batch operating system. So you look at the data, you know, from the East Coast at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and at the w from the West Coast you get two different answers. And when something like a travel claim is processed, it has to be moved between five of these different databases, so it's got to be printed and fat fingered back in. It takes a long time, it moves around the country, and a lot of errors get made. I, uh, even the best workforce, and uh, our, our workforce is, is a little bit of a rotational one in, in some of these areas. So we're consolidating all that stuff, bringing it in closer where we can manage it. We have uh, one new, single, modern, commercial off-the-shelf integrated pay and personnel system. It's going to integrate active and reserve component sailors. Um, I have uh, a little demo. We, we had some troubles getting our Wi-Fi set up this morning, so I can uh, 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 air time it up to the display for you. I'll show it to you a little bit later this morning, but this uh, fall, our center, My Navy Career Center, will open up. That's kind of like the USAA call center, but your first level of being able to do business, everything, pay, personnel, detailing, is going to be my Navy portal on a mobile version of it. How many people have logged on to My Navy portal as it is right now in its beta version? Looks okay, but it's pretty slow and clunky and uh, underwhelming, right? Yeah, at best. But still, you log in and then it, it causes you to log in 14,000 other times because it's still tied to those 255 piece of shit systems right now. <laughs> so when we're done with it, you're not going to need your CAT card. You're going to do it on your smartphone. We're going to have two-factor authentication. I'll show you this afternoon that the, the pilot apps. You'll, your spouse will be able to log on and do their business as well. Uh, but you'll, you'll have a mobile version of it. Uh, you'll be able to access your record. DFAST MyPay. You, you won't have to log into any of those other websites. It's just going to be hardwired right into My Navy Portal. One single login with no CAT card will do everything. So that call center will go into operation in September. The mobile app uh, probably right about the same time. It'll only have a few uh, functions on it, but week by week when it first comes out, you'll be able to look at your record, your training record, do uh, personal action requests, handful of other things that we'll talk about today. But week by week, it'll start getting updates and more and more functions will be added to it. And when we're done with this, you know, it'll be to the point where uh, you, you go between duty stations, you get a set of orders, you're going to get a little notification on your smartphone. Your orders will be on your phone. You'll uh, go to your eye stops at your schools. You're going to take your phone. It's going to have a QR code. You're going to scan it in like you do uh, at TSA or at the airlines when you're using your phone to, as, a, as a plane ticket. And you're checked in. And then when you check out, there's going to be a little notification that says, hey, knucklehead, you forgot to scan in your receipts for your travel claim. So you're going to have to take pictures of those receipts, which are going to be uploaded. So it's already doing your travel claim for you. So 
you know, that's the pain in the ass for everybody, right? Nobody remembers their receipts, and that's why everyone's travel claims are always late. And it'll continue going on until you get to your ultimate duty station. You'll scan in again, and you'll be done. Your travel claim will be done. You'll be checked in. Your pays and entitlements will shift over, and they'll be right the first time because it's a single system, not getting fat fingered between five different ones, and not a lot of human interaction. So that's what's coming. I think you're going to like it when you see the apps, when you see Detailing Marketplace a little bit later today that we have to show you. So um, I think, uh, go uh, one more slide, please. We've been publishing a lot of stuff. Um, nobody reads anymore. Uh, so I'm making cartoons and coloring books for you all and uh, <laughs> making YouTube videos. But also, uh, uh, we're going to do some other things that uh, will let you know what's going on. I think a lot of the Sailor 2025 products are going to be, you're not going to need instructions. Uh, when I did the demo on the, this app, I was able to do everything for PCS move and check in and everything with no instructions. It's, it's like your iPhone, you know, you, you just figure it out. It's pretty easy. But this is kind of the list of everything that's out there. You can go to My Navy Portal, which routes you to all these other places and has banners for it or any of these other things. But we've been writing a ton. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of literature out there. We'll get better at making it a little easier to digest this as we go along. Uh, but we're excited to show you this today. Ask questions. Uh, let us know what, what you think is missing, what we need to add, what we've forgotten, uh, what maybe has been out there and isn't working, uh, that sort of stuff. So thanks for letting me uh, uh, give you that outline here. I'll be here all morning with you uh, and uh, throughout the presentations. Ready for some questions. We've got a couple minutes for uh, questions. Who's up? There we are. Give me a coin there, Brian. Good morning. Good morning, sir. What's your name? Where are you from? Good morning, sir. Um, OS1 Tisdale from the Gerald R. Ford. Thanks for taking the first question. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering with this, this uh, mobile app being put on, um, how is it going to affect the PSs? Uh, they're all going to go away. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Anything but, but that. Uh, we, added, we added 250 last year. We're going to be adding more PSs because the PSs are going to make this all work. Okay. Uh, we are not outsourcing. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to use a lot of contractors for this. We're going to use uh, Navy team as much as possible because I want Navy taking care of Navy. That means Navy civilians too, but um, I don't want to really uh, outsource it. A lot of our problems that we're having with uh, PSD customer service are because we were forced uh, over decades to contract a lot of this stuff out, and it really became a rotational uh, workforce that we had trouble keeping trained up, and uh, I personally think the give a shit factor was, was low. So. Sailors will care for sailors, so I want more PSs, and, and we're adding. So things look bright for the PS community. Very sir. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs> Please. Oh. oh, yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning, sir. My name is Wynwin Williams Benjamin from the Gerald R. Ford. Sir, they said, um, you said about the parental leave policy. Um, males and females are not equal right now with that. It came out last year that said that the male leave policy would change, but it still hasn't changed. I signed an AV admin yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's actually going to be released this morning. So we had to wait for, uh, we had to wait for uh, Secretary of Defense and uh, all the legal teams to come down, but it, so it's coming out uh, today. And the new rules will be um, uh, 14 days, and it's going to be called primary caregiver leave and secondary caregiver, caregiver leave. So now that's adoption leave and paternity leave. You don't have to be married if you're a legal, if you're a legal guardian. 
so it, you'll be eligible for that. And, and we broke up maternity leave into maternity convalescent leave and maternity leave so that there's a provision in there if you're not the birth mother. That answers your question, but you should see that on the street when you get back to uh, your unit. Yes, sir. Thanks for the question. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm ET3 Eccles from the pre-com unit, DVG 117, Paul Ignatius. I was wondering about the uh, new schooling you guys plan on implementing uh, with the different blocks. For the schools that have more electronic theory, how would that work out to ensure that they have enough information to go out into the fleet and be ready? So the question is, uh, how do we make sure you got enough uh, information in the, in the block training? Um, again, the, uh, the uh, communities are driving the curriculum for, for each of the schools. So you said you were ET, is that right? Uh, what, what variation of ET? There's like 20 of them, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a conventional ET specializing in comms. Okay, comms, okay. So everyone's still going to get all that basic theory and everything in block zero. I, what I refer to kind of as A school light. Um, and, and then the, the focus, though, will kind of be what do you need to get through that kind of, uh, if you think about the first C tour, first operational tour, uh, shipboard anyways, you would be working towards, there's kind of two stages of your qualification, right? Got, junior watch stander, while you're also working on your warfare qualification, and then you become sort of a supervisory deck plate watch stander. So the curriculum is built so that you get enough to take you right to the, just a little bit to the edge of that supervisory watch stander. So uh, operator, a little bit of the on watch maintenance stuff, but not the deep maintenance stuff that you're gonna have to do later. That, that would come You'll get a little bit more of that in the block one, which will happen while you're on the sea duty. And then you'll get a whole lot more of it before you go back for your second tour. It's kind of the way it, but you'll, all the electrical theory and uh, electronic uh, fundamentals will all be up front. So that's across the board for every rating. Yeah, so the A school, that part of the A school piece won't really change much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Good morning, sir. Why well, I'm one McKenzie from um, ECRC. So my question is um, for mobilized reservists, because right now we, when we mobilize, they ha we have to wait for the reserve pay account to close before they can open active duty. So with this mobile app, will that affect the reserves as well? Yes, it will. It's going to stop all that pain. Um, I had a, a reserve captain working for me, and uh, the PSD kind of fat fingered something as her pay status uh, changed. and. They took her ID card at the gate, and I lost her for a week while we, I mean, that happens all the time to reservists that, that change uh, their, uh, their uh, duty status. They can inadvertently disappear through the system, and it takes uh, minor acts of God to get back in. This new system is active and reserve. You can, if you're, you're not going to switch all, between yeah. systems okay. anymore. When your pay gets liquidated, it's going to be immediate. Um, the one thing that we had to change is reservists, our, our paydays are going to change to be the same as active duties. Uh, so you'll, you'll get paid on the same two days of the month, which you uh, reservists didn't before. I didn't know that until we started this project. But uh, you learn something new every day. And, um, uh, but it'll all be seamless now. So you'll, it, it'll be another one of those things where you scan the app and boom, it's done. Thank you, sir. Sure. Yeah. Oh, one on the, uh, is the Navy moving away from advancement exams? Um, we're going to talk about advancement exams a lot today. We've got a couple topics on that. Short answer, no. Uh, you know, at one time, when we started Meritorious Advancement Program for two reasons. Um, one, our current eval system is broken, right? You get stuck in traffic. It's a 10-year-based system. Uh, you can walk into, you know, take any peer group, a group of E5s. Uh, you know, or a first class uh, pet officer association, figure out when everybody checked on board, you're the new guy or new gal on board, and you can figure out when or if you're going to get the EP, right? Is that true? Yeah, that's, that's kind of how it was in the Soviet Union, right? 
So we're going to get away from that and go back to merit-based. Um, but the, the MAP program started as a, as a workaround for that, but also at one point we really were toying with the idea of going away from advancement exams. Um, as we were doing that, the Air Force and the Army did it for, I forget who did which, uh, I want to say the Army did E4 and E5, they made the exams go away and Air Force made E4 through E6. I probably have that wrong, it's something along those lines. But the point is that both services had a tremendous amount of trouble by making them entirely go away. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, unfairness claims came up and, uh, you know, little black book systems and things that uh, just didn't seem objective and impartial. And as as frustrated as uh, I was at the time with our advancement e exam system, it's bureaucratic, it's impersonal, it's slow. It, what it does have going for it is it's impartial, it's objective, it's, uh, it's the best thing going among the services. And I think with a little bit of tweaking, we can make it even better. So what we're gonna talk about today is that path. The change that we just announced with pulling out the professional military requirements from the uh, technical stuff for your rating is step one at moving towards an all electronic advancement exam. Okay, we'll get the all electronic stuff moving down the plate and then we're gonna go towards a, uh, uh, we'll talk about rating modernization and the uh, families of NECs, the career groups. We're gonna uh, start doing some clustering among ratings so that there won't, uh, the 20 flavors of ETs that there are, you'll take one more related to your specific type of ET, and then eventually you'll get one that's tailored specifically to your NECs. It'll be specific to you as we work down that path. And that's how we get the laser focus on the, the technical piece of the uh, uh, exam as we go into the future. But So our emphasis is now on just making that exam even better, changing the way we administer it, and, and really focusing on the technical. Uh, but uh, I think I, from what I've, the conversations I've had with sailors, uh, you all, all would welcome that because right now you're being tested on a lot of stuff that doesn't really apply to your day job. And we're focusing on test takers. I think I got time for uh, one more question. I'll take it. Lieutenant. Hi, sir. Lieutenant Junior Grade McKenzie Cobb, USS Gettysburg. So you mentioned earlier this morning that there's, we're increasing the number of ships to 355. Where do ships and modernization fall in those numbers? And how does that, what is the plan to reintegrate those ships back into the fleet? Because I know we're the first ship with the cow pens, and we're seeing a lot of issues with how we're going to reintegrate. Manning portion is great. We've got great manning. Cow pens, not so much. But huh, I don't hear that all the time, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but how, so once we do add con shift and actually rejoin the fleet, that's probably going to change. But how is, I guess, Congress's plan to reintegrate these ships, us, the Cowpens, the Anzio, and everyone else kind of entering and leaving this program. What is Congress's plan? <laughs> um, sorry, no comment. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I actually can't speak to the, the specific timetables or anything like that. I'm just not, I'm not <coughs> fluent on it right now. We could find out, but that, I mean, the overall expectation is that, you know, we're going to get through these maintenance cycles as fast as we can. Uh, Congress, as well as all the Navy leadership, understand the challenges. We've really uh, uh, overloaded the, um, uh, you know, the shipyard uh, capacity, uh, both our government, uh, you know, Navy shipyards, as well as uh, commercial shipyards. Uh, we're doing some creative things to, to help out with that. And this is really kind of a backlog of all the, uh, another sequestration thing where we put off maintenance, we deferred it, and we'd been running uh, the entire Navy hard, our airframes, you know, uh, being used at twice the intended rate, same thing with our ships. So this is really kind of a catch up period on maintenance, they understand that. But as fast as we can get through then, uh, uh, are you talking integration in terms of where they might go in the strategic laydown plan or what, what aspect of integration? 
Well, so do we count in those numbers, or do we count for the numbers of ships that we that are already here? Oh, you you will definitely count at some point in time. Though some of them some <laughs> of them come and go though throughout time. But there is a year by year ship count, if that's your question. And and I couldn't tell you exactly where Kaufman fits into that, but I'm sure she's she's young, and uh, she'll be in there when we get to 355. Uh, but I can find out. I've I've got that data. We can get it here this yes, morning. Sir. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for this morning. We'll be here. A lot more detail throughout the morning. Really, if you don't stay for the whole time, please go go talk to the detailers, community managers. Do stay for the detailing marketplace demo, which I think is uh, third or fourth on the agenda. That uh, that is worth your trip over here. So, thanks for your attention this morning. Thank you, CNP.